So today we have the pleasure to speak with Jeff Lee Gabriela Molina. Jeff Lee, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so I usually start asking our, uh, our guests to say, where is spending your crazy 2020? Uh, could you tell us where, where you are right now? I am in Chicago, Illinois, in my studio of Mana Contemporary. And this is where I have spent most of this crazy 2020. <laughs> That's not a bad way to spend 2020, right? Creating. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So we're big fans of your work, but we would love to share with our audiences a little bit about your background. How did you become this amazing artist that you are today? Of course. Well, I am originally from Táchira, Venezuela. Táchira is in the Andes. And as a child, I always lived in that area, in different states, but always in the Andes. Um, I started being, um, let's say, preoccupied with art from when I was very young, probably three or four years old. Mm -hmm. uh, my first painting is from around that time. I made this paint, little painting of a few cows in a field. And the funny thing is that the painting of the cows in a field wasn't of real cows in a field that I saw. It was of another painting in a flower vase that my mother had in the kitchen. So that, that was my first work of art. And that happened before I was probably between ages three and four. Then after that, I just was always interested in different forms of art. I wanted to act, sing, uh, write, but perhaps I didn't have these other talents or perhaps just my ability to draw well and my curiosity for painting led me to be very consistent on the on that field on the visual arts i began painting more consistently when i was a teenager and very soon at the age of 15 i was given the opportunity to exhibit with some university professors and well-known artists of the city i grew up in san cristobal and the exhibition took place in the cultural center and it was it now it, it was the opening there was a major of the city and all of these so that i think made my parents a little bit more comfortable about my choice of career mm -hmm. and it was then when i decided that i wanted to come to the states to go to a university and study art and back then my parents didn't know how or where or how that was going to be possible because that necessarily didn't fit in, in, in their possibilities. But because I am the child of very young and hardworking parents, they were very open to the idea and they supported it. So I came to, first to Miami, I lived in Miami for a few years with my aunt Fifi, who has this fabulous restaurant and in the restaurant there in Miami, I, I went to a community college to learn how to speak English first. And then when I was ready, I was able to take some more advanced classes. I applied to the New World School of the Arts that has a partnership with the community college. And that is where I started my art education. Uh, while working at the restaurant with my aunt. And the restaurant was filled with my paintings uh, that I had brought from Venezuela and that I had made in the first few months that I lived in the States. And so one day this beautiful couple that came to the restaurant and fell in love with my work, they offered me the opportunity to come to Chicago and to visit the city. And eventually that led to them encouraging me to apply to the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, which is a private school, um, quite expensive. I, at the time, didn't know that education was so expensive in this country. 
I was attending a community college and as an international student, that was as expensive as a school could get for me. Um, so I came to Chicago, fell in love with the city from, from the moment I visited. And then I applied to the school. I was admitted to the school and they paid for my undergrad. And then after that, I decided to do my master's here as well, also at the School of the Art Institute. And now I am here. So going back to my original story, a story about my background, I, when I was a teenager and the, the, the decision to become an artist became more real, I proposed to my parents that I would come and study in a university in the States and that has all happened. Um, and now I am here at Mana Contemporary Chicago, where I have this lovely studio that you can see behind me. It's so important to have people who support your dreams, especially yeah. as an artist. Yeah. And super sensitive, like, and I feel that like, your creations are a part of you in a way. Uh, but yeah. we are, we're very lucky that you found those people on your way and that everything happened the way it did. So we can yeah. enjoy your amazing work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's um, been a really wonderful story. Yes. Uh, we, we would love to know a little bit more about sources of inspiration for you. What is it that uh, it, like, inspires the way, you uh, the way you create, like subjects, like, and, uh, you know, different things? I think that, I think, no, I know that what moves me most are the things that have affected me or people around me emotionally um, or physically. And by physically, I mean sometimes the fact that I left Venezuela, that Venezuela is pretty much falling apart and has been falling apart for, for more than a decade now. Uh, my family has had to leave. I recently had my mother moving here with me. So the things that inspire my work the most are themes of family, of loss, loss of a place, loss of a culture, love of a person, themes of love. I think that that sentiment is so complex. I always ponder it in my work in its different iterations, whether it's uh, the love a daughter feels towards a mother, the love that a, a woman or a a lover feels towards another lover, the love of a woman towards herself. All of these things, uh, all of these themes weave my ideas, are weaved into my ideas for a painting. And that more recently, I have also been interested in revisiting some of my very specific memories that are coming back to me, especially this year because of what is happening. I did not grow up in a religious family, but there were religious traditions that we followed, uh, especially Catholic traditions. Uh, one of them, and you can see in one of my latest paintings that I, that I posted on, on Instagram, uh, is the the, the presence of the glass of water in the family homes and what that glass of water meant. The glass of water was put there usually by a mother or a grandmother or by an aunt, the women of the family that are, tend to be a little bit more spirit, spiritual. Um, and it will be a, a glass of, of, of water for the souls in purgatory. And more than an act of mercy for the souls, it was more of a, of a trade. My, my mother, for instance, would give them water whenever she wanted the souls to
to help us with something or the, or the family, a family member was in distress or there was an anxiety or fear about something. So this year, we have had this series of events happening everywhere in the world. And now my mother lives with me and I see her putting the glass of water for souls in purgatory. So that things get a little better. Yeah, and, and, and I found a lot of beauty in that gesture because what it means to me is that things have fallen out of our control, especially for my family that is, as I said, not that religious. They really are very cool. They never, not, not that people that are very religious are not cool, but in, in my family, religion is, is, is something to, to, to treat with care. Not, not, nobody really takes it too hard, too much. Uh, but this gesture of the glass of water is still there and is um, a beautiful gesture of faith, of hope, that if I do this one thing, things will start getting better. If I put my mind to it, uh, I hope things start getting better. The act of prayer is a beautiful thing. So, Yes. As you're saying, as you're saying uh, about your family's interpretation and take on religion, you know, it just made me feel like that, like that it's seen also a little bit in your work, you know, like that you kind of like you have like a reading like of a situation like or an image, and then you're able to extract the parts that like made more sense that it's in stick yeah. to you like yeah. and, uh, and have that like represented in your work yeah. like but like in a, in a different way yeah well so. you just touch on something very important which is that i myself as an individual i'm not very religious i'm not very superstitious i'm not very even metaphysical mm -hmm. but as a painter i am uh, my paintings mm -hmm. have a lot of symbolism in them my paintings have a lot of ritual a lot of magic my paintings do believe in god my paintings completely believe in the impossible and the and and in symbols and in 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 all of these things that we just do not know in mystery um that for instance a painting of the parrot that the writing in that painting is a letter that I wrote, it's a poem uh, written in the form of a letter that I wrote to my great grandmother that, it, that passed when I was probably four years old. And I am updating her in the trends um, of our time. And I said, she had a parrot. The parrot just died. Parrots live forever, which is another thing that I can talk about, about the parrots in my paintings. Uh, the fact that they can speak our language, right? No, it's better, it's something yeah. so unusual in an animal, even if they're not that intelligent, that the fact that they can communicate with words is, is a, something mesmerizing to me. And, and that kind of magic, that kind of imagination, I bring into the work, uh, kind of like a, a, like a, a, a fiction writer, like a magical realism uh, writers will do into their work. So this painting, uh, I tell my grandmother somewhere in the poem, and do you know that, that glitter and gold have gone out of fashion and that your parrot no longer remembers himself? I'm telling her her parrot have has gotten so old he kind of doesn't remember himself anymore mm -hmm. and i'm telling her that glitter and gold she used to love craft and making these beautiful things and doilies and and she had this porcelain swan uh on a cupboard and all of these things were very precious for her and therefore in the house where she lived they were they had such dignity these ornaments and these things so this is an example of me not only trying to communicate with my great-grandmother through a poem, through a painting, I am also talking about life and death. Um, and uh, that is the part where, where 
something metaphysical, something mysterious, uh, if religion or, or, or superstition plays a very important role in my work. Uh, and that's how I define it. My paintings do believe in, in all these things. It's God. But, yeah. So now that we cover a little bit about your background and also subjects, uh, can you talk about your process? What is what is a typical day for you at the studio like, and how do you go about on the creation of one of your artworks? Right. So for my artwork, I tend to uh, when I ha I'm having a painting day, I try to come to the studio early. I almost, I am here early almost every day. But if I am painting, sometimes I come here earlier. And I start my coffee. I water my plants, especially in summer. In winter or in fall, I am more relaxed. But in summer, I have this huge window that really uh, dries my plants in no time. So they demand water almost every day. I stir my coffee. I sometimes like to be in silence for the first hours of painting. And probably after lunch, when my energy starts uh, falling, I either take a nap or I put music to wake me up. Um, my paintings usually start with me writing down ideas. And these ideas I call I call, I call these lists of ideas um, an, an, an inventory of ideas. I have this um, list written in my notebooks. I can actually share one with you. So this is a, a, a sketchbook of mine. And here is, yeah, uh, one, Tuesday, 16 October of 2018, um, inventory of ideas, they are lists. And I can read a little bit what this list says. That's a long uh, list of ideas. Yeah, so inventory of ideas, revised. This is a revised list. A container for personal objects made of glass, a tablecloth a caress, a sky, a bird, a dream, the idea of wind, a child that is a gray monochrome, a runner, sea, water, table, a, new, a nude with a parrot, historical artifacts, an old man and a mirror, a parrot, flowers, a good woman, cleaning with a towel, a bed or a mattress, floor with tiles, an organized closet, people looking at themselves, a hand pinching another, curtains. That's an example of what, what my ideas, my inventory of ideas um, reads like. And from them, I start drawing parrots. I, I start limiting my ideas to one or two, whichever call my attention the most. And then I make a drawing. And then that drawing grows into a collage or into a more complicated image. And then as I am developing the image, things come to the surface. Sometimes I don't have a definite intention. Like this is going to be a painting about loss or about love or about family. This is just what is happening in my life and what affects me the most. I am most affected by these things of my life, by my family, by my love for people around me, by the loss of anyone around me. So that's when these other things start playing a role in the image. Like, okay, it's a parrot, but what, what how do I make this parrot convey something? Where does this parrot come from? Oh, it comes from my great-grandmother. Okay, great. I wrote a poem about my great-grandmother. Can I marry these two images? And, and so that's how things start collaging and layering 
and become something a little bit more complex and compelling enough for me to decide to paint it because I do not make a painting until I don't have a solid idea that then have already an intention within. So for me, the, the, the intention is very important to define that before yeah. I start painting. Yeah. Absolutely. It's so interesting to hear about and to think about your work. Uh, definitely makes a lot of sense and it makes more sense like looking at the work now we know like where uh, why that's uh, the way it is um so definitely like uh, unfortunately we're approaching the end of the interview it's it's a short interview but we love to wrap it up um uh, usually asking our guests to talk a little bit more about things that help to like navigating this year a little bit better, you know? So like uh, suggestions of like maybe a book you've read that inspired you, like, or a movie, uh, um, something that helped you like keeping your spirit up uh, yeah. during this time of uncertainty. Yeah. Um, I will not recommend you movies because I love horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> and I do not think that you guys want that. But, but I do have, I do have, a, I love dancing. Dancing makes me happy. Dancing absurdly is an exercise for me to think outside of my box. Sometimes when I'm very heavy in my feelings, in my anxieties of the day, I dance like a crazy person in my studio. I go around and I do crazy things. And sometimes I also try to do beautiful dances, right? Most of the time I try to look beautiful. Dance. What do you dance to? Try, uh, what do you dance to? Different. Sometimes the other day I was listening to Silvia Perez, I think is her name. She's a Spanish singer. Uh, beautiful, amazing, very exotic voice. Uh, sometimes I dance to Christine and the Queens. Uh, sometimes I dance to rock and roll, uh, The Cure. I, I mean, really, I, I have a very eclectic taste for music. Uh, so that's, an, would, that's an amazing suggestion. And it's the first time that it's coming up and yeah. I couldn't agree more. I, I call it dance therapy. Yeah. <laughs> when I used to go out dancing, I'm gonna dance more at home too. Yeah, yeah, I really highly recommend it. It, it really makes you sometimes feel a little crazy and that is yeah. good. You yes. sometimes need to feel a little crazy to, to allow sides of yourself yeah. that you, you yourself are not sure about come out and express yeah. themselves. It's important to be crazy <laughs> a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Well, yeah. Jeffrey, thank you so much. Uh, it has been a huge pleasure talking to you, learning about your life, your work, uh, your practice, and uh, we hope that you enjoyed this conversation as well. And uh, thank you to everyone who was with us and who is, uh, will be watching this webinar. And next week, we're going to have more. So thank bye. Thank you guys so much. Thank, Thank you. you.